much longer than the pre-writing and the writing stage. I'm just going to kind of go through these sort of quickly, and you can do searches on them and find more things on them on the internet. Um, but they are, I think, very useful. Has anyone not heard of free writing before? Okay. So free writing is a way of either beginning your writing day, or getting through a writing block, or generating ideas. It's kind of like brainstorming with yourself. And it's another timed writing exercise. So you sit down, and you decide how much time you're going to spend on it, and you decide what you're going to center it around. So can I have someone's thesis topic? Or a chapter that they're working on? Like a, like what, like a, just a concept? Sure. What about shame? Shame. So let's say that you're writing on shame, and you're feeling really like you just can't even start. There's something you just no, you can't start writing on that day, or you've been a week and a half, and every time you sit in front of your computer, all of a sudden you realize you need milk and you go to the grocery store. But. <laughs> so free writing is a mode, and I think it's very interesting and useful, especially if you mostly write on a computer, to do this by hand. Um, mm. But you can also tape a piece of paper over your computer screen and in your document and type without being able to see it. Where for a certain amount of time, Ten minutes, you just write, and you don't stop, you don't punctuate, you don't go back, you don't edit. Um, when I've talked about this with scientist friends, they've sometimes started off saying that wouldn't work for me, um, but actually it does. So try it whatever discipline you're in, even if it sounds kind of woo and new agey. Um, you just write. You write continuously. So sometimes it's called free and continuous writing. And in the example of shame, you might start by just using saying the word shame is. And then you would just write about whatever comes to your mind. If you come to a point where you don't know what you're going to think, you would write shame is, shame is, shame is, shame is, over and over again. Um, so a scientist friend who did this was writing about slime molds as something that was sort of interestingly in between sentient and non-sentient life form, and um, you know, and wrote about like slime molds are smart. That was the the free writing anchor, and that became a whole chapter in her dissertation. Slime molds are. So whatever it is, you, you can use free writing as a mode to just un uncork yourself, to be able to like just get going. And that can be something that you do as part of a unit of writing or before you, before you start writing. After you do a free writing, then you go through and you can see, sometimes you'll have like, your brain will just, in, when it's relaxed, it'll pop out with like a perfect phrase that says exactly what you mean. So you can go back and reread free writes and underline them and pull out particular <coughs> phrases and do another free write on that phrase. You know, the free write can itself become a seed for a thing. Another thing that's not on here that is a really useful technology is when you're feeling blocked, um, pick someone who you know is an interesting, interested, smart person, doesn't know anything about your topic, and literally, actually, and in fact, write them a letter and send it. Write them an email, write them a physical letter. Um, have an audience that you're writing for where you need to explain something that you're feeling interested in and you don't quite know what to talk about. And if you don't know anyone like this, I can give you my friend Sumner Bradley, who is a really smart, interesting person, graduated from university with a dance degree, lives in rural Vermont, um, and he actually likes getting these emails. I have several <laughs> friends who have written to him with what they're trying to think about. Um, or my mom is another good one. If you don't have anyone like this and you want to just you can say, Dear Janet, you know, I am working on metaphysics and I'm not sure what to think about Hume. Whatever, you know? So you have a person and you put it in a different format. This is the thing about free writing and the email idea is that you're taking yourself out of the Microsoft Word or Open Office or whatever you use and you're you're clicking your brain into a different kind of mold. So it allows you to be looser. Note carding is another um, option. This is when you have a huge amount of text and you don't know what's happening with it. You suspect it's not very well organized and you'd like to work on it, but you don't even know how. You go through the document and for every thing that you're doing, every topic that you're doing, you write on a little note card what is happening there. Sometimes you write the page, sometimes you just write the topic. Um, but every Everything, maybe every paragraph, gets its own note card. Then you take these note cards, and you tape them onto a wall, you spread them all over your floor, and 
you're able to actually look at them and say, that actually belongs over here. You could cluster them together in different ways. Um, you can merge this with the next one, which is color coding and remapping. If something is a particular result that you're finding, that could be red, right? And you could see all the different things that have red on them. And it might mean that actually, you know, when you physically manifest the dissertation or the thesis in this form, all of a sudden you see ways that it wants to be totally reorganized. Um, these can be, note carding can be as small or as big as you like. And it's sometimes useful to have a wall where you can actually just move the cards around as things happen or add new cards in. So note carding, note carding is a kind of revision technology. The mode here is to try to be, um, it's called not too tight or not too loose. And the image is of like a lute player um, tuning their lute. So you want to have um, the right amount of discipline for you to write, combined with the sort of lubrication to allow you to get going. So, so all of these things, and there's a bunch of writing books that you can, that I actually recommend that people read that aren't about academic writing, they're about creative writing, that help with that part of things. So in the, so you, then you've done some writing. Um, in the post-writing, one of the things that's important is to have this flexible capacity to respond to feedback, and also in some cases to hold your ground. So sometimes you'll get feedback from your supervisors that's where they're just like, I don't like this chapter at all, I don't see where you're going. And that is something that you can take as a useful message that you are not yet being clear enough about what you're doing. And it doesn't mean that the writing isn't good, the project isn't good. All it means is that you need to be either um, better about explaining something or change your tactics so that it makes more sense to the people you're talking to. So you take that as not a sort of death sentence, but as something that means that you can rephrase. So you take it as an opportunity, and that's also part of this not too tight, not too loose approach. The last thing is just this general thing, which is to understand free writing and, and revision is as important to writing itself. So if you're in that space where you are just totally stuck and you can't do it, um, when you start to do things like, I'm gonna take a walk for this unit, like I'm gonna take this 45 minute unit and walk and think about my project, that actually is a form of pre-writing. Like active thinking is a form of that. Um, all of these things, note taking, these are also forms of pre-writing, especially when you're orienting that activity toward the writing process. switch gears a little bit, and again, I'm sorry that I know I'm moving quickly. But this, I think, is really important, and, it, and I don't think this is something that you get told actually explicitly very often, and I think that that's wrong. There is this thing where sort of you're somehow supposed to know all the aspects of academic culture, you know, and you get penalized if you don't, or people sort of indicate to you that you're somehow doing something wrong. Um, and these are some things that uh, I think really help with this. So it is good to communicate with advisors and committees. Um, it's, a, it's a good thing to do. You don't gain anything by not talking to them for a semester or a year. Um, and so it's useful to know how to communicate with them. One thing is that you should understand, it, I mean hopefully, hopefully the faculty that you're working with actually give you feedback that is useful. Um, Faculty tend to be, um, you know, by turns, incredibly generous and available, um, very cranky and unavailable, um, very open to dialogue, uh, very, you know, you just don't know what they're going to be like. So faculty feedback is very useful and it's kind of an unknown quantity at the same time. So you want to try to um, work with the person you're working with in such a way that they understand what you're doing and that they can help you on the things that you want help with. So this is why I'm saying brief your faculty well. And this is what I mean by that. Um, when you give them a piece of writing, because in general, faculty will have a whole lot of things that they're working on. And the things that they're working on are probably kind of close to the things that you're working on, or you wouldn't be working with them. The things that you're working on often are different than the things that they're working on. And if you don't mark those differences and give them a framework to think with you about those things, they will tend to read your project with their own research eyes. 
So this is this memo that you're going to attach to every piece of writing that you give to a faculty member is a way to snap that person into a framework that can actually help you in your writing and in your project. So this is something that you pass in on paper. You should pass drafts to faculty on paper, um, stapled together with something. And the cover letter should have something like this. This is, again, me being didactic. But so you should begin with a date and a salutation that says, dear doctor, whatever. Here is, and you say what this is, and you be very specific. Here is 25 pages um, setting up my literature review. This is a third draft. And this, I imagine, to be two-thirds of chapter one, right? So you give them the number of pages, what the pages are doing, um, what kind of draft they're at, and where they fit into the whole project. Um, and that means that they, you know, they might be working with a bunch of people. So this situates them in terms of your project, and it, let, it gives them a framework with which to open the next page. It's also totally appropriate to say, here, in this piece, I take myself to be arguing this. Saying that in this cover letter immediately uh, derails a whole lot of confusion that can happen. Where a lot of times, if you don't say that, and let's say that you're not being totally clear about what you're arguing, right? So you think you're being very clear in the paper that that's what you're arguing, but maybe you're not actually. If you've said this in the cover letter, the person reading it can say, you say that you want to argue this, but actually the paper seems to me to be more arguing this other thing. So it immediately sort of corrals the comment, it corrals the, uh, the response, so that it's actually speaking to what you're trying to do, instead of to all the various things that can get projected onto a piece of writing. Then you also give them specific guidelines for the kind of feedback you want. Um, so if you're just looking for I wanted to show this for, to you to get a general sense of whether you think I'm going in the right direction with how I'm writing up this research. You say that. If you say, um, you have seen, and this is, you know, this is um, something that you could say earlier. You've seen two other drafts of this, and I think that we are on the same page about the overall argument in this paper. Now I'm looking for sentence-level feedback. Or you could say, um, I would like feedback on whether you think I have enough um, sources cited in this, in this piece. So whatever kind of feedback you want, you can really directly ask for it. That is, it's okay to do, and it um, uses the time and the energy that that person is putting into reading your work in a way that actually helps you. And you don't have to worry that this means that that's the only thing that they're going to address. You know, faculty, in my experience, always address other stuff. But these are the things that you actually definitely want them to give you feedback on. And then this is very important. If you feel like you're coming to the end of your dissertation or the end of your thesis, this is the place in the cover letter where you would ask of your supervisor or your committee members, is this something that you feel you could sign off on? Right? I think that I am really almost done. This is the penultimate draft. Do you agree with me? You have to ask that explicitly, because it is a rare faculty member who will say, I think you're done, you can stop writing. But often, they will say, yeah, that's OK. I think you are done. Or you could be done if you just change these two things. So you have to be able to ask that explicitly, and just feel like that's an OK thing for you to do. Yeah? Is that form to give them a deadline for that? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. So the question is, is it bad form to give them a deadline? No, absolutely not. And especially, it's useful to say, um, if you have substantive comments, I need them back by, you know, this date, so that I can get revisions to you in order to graduate. Um, <laughs> when I finished my dissertation, I was living in Alaska. My committee was in California, and for three of them, literally, I said, if I don't hear back from you by October 15th, I will assume that you are happy with this draft. And two of them, I didn't hear back from, and they said, yeah, I was happy with the draft, and so. You know, right? And then you have that in writing. So if later they did happen to say, I wasn't happy with that draft, you can say, well, I gave you this, you know, I gave you this draft on September 12th, and you said in general you need a month to look at things, and you know, you never said anything, so. 
you, you can do all of this stuff with your supervisor. Um, like in conversation, it may be that your supervisor is bad at getting drafts back to you. And beginning to peg some of those things, like this is when I need it back, is a, a good thing in terms of being able to um, help that person help you better. Or if you end up needing to switch to another supervisor or to get the chair of the department involved, you'll have a sort of map of like, here's what's happened between us, um, which is better to have in this kind of formal way. And this is like a little paranoid, it probably won't happen to you, but it's better to have it in this kind of formal mode that then you've been queuing it. And, and overwhelmingly, people don't actually usually include these kinds of things. And I, I really do think that this is a predictor of success in getting good faculty feedback. Um, so I think it's worth doing. OK. So, oh, sorry, was there any other questions about that? The letter, the memo? for writing. This is really important and it's it's useful to think about this explicitly and there are lots of different support structures that you can have. A lot of the things that I've been saying I actually think of as support structures for writing. Um, they, you know, these things I think actually do manifest. Do we take a survey? I send it back to philosophy. Um, they manifest sort of ways for you to support yourself doing this process. One thing you can do, though, is to explicitly prepare your friends or your lovers or your family or your kids for the fact that you're going to be writing something and that it's going to be hard. And so that means that you can say, you know, I'm, I'm only going to be able to really, um, for the next three months, I'm going to really need Saturday mornings to myself. Is it OK? Will you take the kids to soccer? I don't know if actually kids go to soccer on Saturday mornings, but whatever it is. Or like, I have this sign, it says, I love you, but do not open this door. <laughs> when that sign's on the door, do not open it, you know? Um, now that you have this transmission about the unit system, when someone comes in, you can say, I'm in the middle of the unit, and they'll be like, oh, sorry, I'll be back, right? So whatever it is, you set them up. And then they can be really like, you can have this quality of being clear about what you're doing, and you can um, prep them to actually help you do this. Because having your loved ones be on board with what you're doing, even if they don't understand why you're doing it or they don't think it's a worthwhile thing to do, um, just opening that conversation really helps. So this gets back to the point about what happens if you know you only have 20% of the time that really works. You should start to structure your material and psychic <coughs> reality um, along the lines of what actually works. So if you see yourself being able to write well at a particular time of day, or it really helps for you to be in a cafe where you feel like people are around you and you're anonymous. Whatever that is, try to build writing time around the things, the places where you observe yourself writing well. Um, for almost everyone, this means really try to have a place where you can write that isn't your bedroom. It's often not possible for people, but it's um, when there's something that you're having a hard time with or when you're struggling with things, it's um, hard to sleep. And if you haven't slept, it's hard to work. So if there are ways that you can do that, you know, it might mean there are carols in the library, you can apply for them. Um, if you know that there's a particular time when a lab is free and quiet, you can go there then. But try to be intentional about like, when, when does this work and what happens? You know? And try to make yourself do it like that. Um, it's also useful to consider forming a small, manageable, functional, trustworthy writing group. And what I mean by this is a group of people who are roughly either working on similar topics or in the same field or at the same stage, who you like, uh, you feel like they will actually read drafts and get them back to you. Um, they are not downers. They don't just complain all the time about grad school. They're actually wanting to work or <coughs> they're wanting to work on things. This can be very, very supportive. Even if you just have a group of people where you, you say, okay, every Thursday at 8.30 a.m., we're just gonna go and write in that cafe together don't talk, we'll just get together and write. And then you have someone that's actually structuring you, whatever it is. So writing groups can, be, can range from like, let's physically put ourselves in the same place and work on writing for a unit, to let's read each other's drafts and give feedback. Um, and this is something that I only say consider, because it's important to assess whether writing groups actually are helping, 
or whether they're not. Um, it is actually a support structure to submit work to conferences and journals. Um, whatever stage you're at, there is a conference or a journal that is working in that stage. So there are undergrad conferences and journals, there are graduate conferences that are aimed at MA students, there are PhD conferences and journals. And having some of those things to help you get feedback on whether you're participating in this conversation or to give you a deadline to get something done actually can function as a kind of support. Um, and you can do this either just by yourself or you know, in some cases you'll be submitting work with you know, the person who's the primary investigator for your project or um, someone who's sort of working with you on something. And sometimes you just need to ask them and they'll, they'll be like, sure, you know, I would co-write a paper with you on that. It's, or I would present at a conference with you. And if you're a grad student at Laurentian, it's really important to know that the grad division gives you $500 a year to travel to conferences. And you should totally take advantage of that. Not anymore. No, oh, yeah. They did the past. They did not. You get 300 once per program. 300 once per program? And there's okay. nothing well, so this is something that I think that graduate students should start agitating against. <laughs> because that is ridiculous. We got the per program we live in. Once per program. Once per program. Yeah. Absolutely. But this is also something that when you work with people, you know, sometimes faculty will be like, I would like to support you going to that program, that conference. I will help. Um, you know, I'll give you some money out of my professional allowance so that you can do that. So still do it, and let's try to get the grad division to give that money back. Cause that's and it has to be an international or international conference. Do you know, so this is something that the grad division just I, did? Yeah, I applied for it and I was second author in some 